sources of 18th century relativism, and let's address those first. Above all, the consequences of John Locke's epistemology. Despite its obvious encouragement of seeing knowledge as something sociable, social, and universally communicable, the new Lockean epistemology, Locke's dominant theory of knowledge for the 18th century, carries within it the seeds of relativism. If, as Locke taught, one's knowledge, beliefs, and moral ideas are bounded and determined by one's experience, then it follows absolutely that one's sense of the world, one's values, one's beliefs about things are relative to time, place, and personal experience. Also, if you think back to Locke's doctrine of nominal and real essences, his, dismissible, his dismissal of the possibility of knowing things as they truly and substantially are, Locke's epistemology, Locke's epistemology establishes that we know only the appearances of things. And finally, Locke's doctrine makes one's belief relative to the nature of the human senses. If all of our knowledge is derived from these five senses, which are in some sense accidents of our body, what is to say that the world is at all that which we experience by means of these five senses. Locke himself had asked, for example, what would we believe about the world if we had microscopic eyes? There's nothing natural about having eyes that do the magnification our eyes do. What if we saw the world magnified ten times? or magnified a thousand times? What if we had additional senses or fewer senses? What would our knowledge, our beliefs, our sense of the world, our values be? When Voltaire popularizes John Locke in some of his early philosophical tales, Voltaire imagines visitors to Earth from distant space. Despite exponentially longer lives and more senses than human, one with a hundred senses, one with a thousand senses, they lament their ignorance. We live only 10,000 years. What could we possibly learn about the world? We have only a thousand senses. What could we possibly know about this totality of the universe? So within Lockeanism itself are certain seeds of relativism. In addition, as a general phenomenon, there is Europe's ongoing and quite striking encounter with foreign and, for Europeans, exotic peoples, the effect of which is multiplied by the growth of printing and the reading public, which produces a wide audience for reports from distant places and other peoples, and an astonishment within European culture about the differences among nations, civilizations, and peoples. Not only are Europeans aware that other people seem so very bizarre to them, but they are now absolutely aware that they seem so very curious and bizarre to the other peoples whom they visit and encounter. There is a growing curiosity in Europe about how the world would look if one had been born elsewhere in a different civilization 
with a different set of beliefs and values. Europeans are so struck by worldwide differences in things they had taken to be constant. The differences in the treatment of women and the elderly by other cultures. The diversity of religions and moral codes and beliefs the difficulty of translation astonishes Europeans, that missionaries, for example, or travelers will attempt to find equivalents for words that in a European language are absolutely essential to talking about reality and not find an equivalent word in a foreign culture. In some ways, Europeans are quite struck by the simple fact of the flourishing of non-Christian cultures. They had been told so often that absent Christianity, it's one of the doctrines that supports the official view of the necessity of religious intolerance, that without Christian culture, civilization would fall to pieces. But there is China, thousands of years old, with a flourishing and ordered society. In fact, Voltaire will begin his history of the world with China. If one looks at bestsellers of the late 17th and early 18th centuries, one sees the development of this curiosity. A work called The Turkish Spy, supposedly written by a spy from the great port, the Sultanate of the Ottoman Empire, reporting on the courts of Europe. The Thousand and One Nights, the tales of Scheherazade, go through edition after edition, and all accounts of American Indians become extraordinary sellers uh, in the European reading public. In addition to these general sources of relativism, there are things very particular to Montesquieu's circumstance that add to his own sense of relativism in the world, a background that makes him particularly sensitive to difference and to divergent perspectives. Montesquieu grows up in the milieu of the Parliament of Bordeaux. The parliaments had been throughout French history a final court of appeal for a province or region of France. In the 17th century, Louis XIV breaks so much of the power of those parliaments. And Montesquieu is raised in a household that inculcates in him an awareness of how what now seems natural to the French, the absolute power of Louis XIV, is so different from the prior pattern of provincial and regional history. He becomes aware of the variations in absolutism and arbitrary power. In addition, he marries a Huguenot. His wife is a French Protestant, and he is intensely aware not only of the issue of toleration, but of the extraordinary importance of the accident of birth. His intellectual encounters after he comes to Paris dramatically heighten his sense of the relativity of beliefs. He becomes friends with and frequently attends meetings of a remarkable group of savants, of scholars, of erudite men in Paris, at what was called the Academy of Inscriptions. The crown in France, through travel and through missionaries and indeed through explorations, had gathered coins and medals from all around the world, some of them extremely ancient. And the king patronized scholars to tell him what he had. These people are studying these ancient metals and inscriptions. They are studying the ancient world. They are aware of variations between chronologies in the world and the Judeo-Christian chronology. They are aware of comparative ancient religions and beliefs. 
They are aware of the resemblance of roles in different cultures, but roles that are of such substantive differences in terms of the beliefs of clergy or crowns or judges. They are people who live two lives, a public life of erudition and a private life of a sense that there is a world of relative difference out there, not only geographically but across time, that puts so much of what Europeans believe into doubt. Montesquieu becomes very close to the king's librarian of Chinese books acquired by French Chinese contact who was someone converted in China to Catholicism. He comes to France expecting to arrive at a country where everyone loves his neighbor as himself, where if you strike someone on the cheek, the person would turn the other cheek. And he is astonished at the difference between what French Catholics in theory believe and the nature of the civilization that they've produced. And Montesquieu talks to him with extraordinary interest about his perception. And finally, recalling our most recent lectures, Montesquieu is a deist, a convinced deist in Christian Europe, which will do a great deal to advance one's sense of the relativity of belief. In the 1720s, he writes under a pseudonym a work that will become a bestseller of the 18th century, Montesquieu's Persian Letters. They are an epistolary novel in which he claims to have found letters written by Persian travelers to each other and to friends and authorities back in Persia. And that structure of an epistolary novel allows Montesquieu a great freedom to show how France and the West might look through foreign, in this case, Persian eyes, and gives Montesquieu great freedom to comment both on his own world and to deepen his reader's sense of the relativity of belief to time and place. He engages in the satire of relativism. When his Persians try to explain the Pope, they say, he's a great magician. He can make people believe that three equals one, discussing the Trinity. When he speaks of the king, he says, he's a great magician. He can debase the currency and make people believe that two equals one. His Persians write back describing bishops as people who gather together in order to pass rules that they then separate to sell exemptions to. He also now can speak of the humor of ethnocentrism when the Persians take off their Western disguises and people ask them, who are you? And one says, I'm a Persian. A Frenchman in a line that French audiences love says to him in the novel, a Persian? But how could anyone be a Persian? But the deepest question that Montesquieu poses in the Persian letters is, what is relative to time and place and what is natural and absolute everywhere? The ultimate goal of the Persian letters is to distinguish between what is malleable, plastic, variable in its form according to time, place, and circumstance, and what is common to all human experience. The implications for politics are dramatic, for we see varieties of despotism everywhere, but an indication that there is a natural law of liberty toward which the world tends. The implications for religion are dramatic, for Montesquieu presents varieties of dogma that everyone believes with fervor, depending upon where 
he or she is born, but also a natural law of God's justice and a natural law of God's truth as understood by science. There are dramatic implications for ethics. We see an extraordinary variety of moral codes, one in which incest is the norm. But we also see the reality of natural consequences. Human beings may vary what they believe. They may vary the forms of human organization. They may vary the ways in which they live their lives, but these things do not occur in a human construct. They occur in a real nature with real consequences to our beliefs, to our ways of doing things that we ignore at our peril. For the world has real and natural consequences quite apart from any human belief. There are dramatic implications for ethics. The variety, excuse me, uh, there are dramatic implications for psychology. Montesquieu presents us with varieties of male-female relationships, for example the relative freedom of French women in the Persian eyes, the despotism under which Persian women live protected in the harem, both seeming utterly natural to the cultures in which those occurs, and yet he knows that there is a permanent human nature beneath that variation. And there are profound implications for philosophy because we encounter so many varieties of approaches to knowledge, but there is a singularity of natural truth. Montesquieu in the Persian letters and Voltaire in his philosophical tales about visitors from space increasingly speak for a consensus that is emerging in what will be called the French Enlightenment. That as human beings, we think differently, but there are standards of real and natural truth. The visitors from space, in Voltaire's tale, are astonished by what for them are the folly, the absurdities of human beliefs. But they ask those human beings, what's the distance between your planet and the sun? And by scientific triangulation and calculation, both the foolish earthlings and the wise sages from space have reached exactly the same calculation. Voltaire's earthlings are fighting wars over scraps of mud. The visitors find them absurd, but where can they agree? They can agree upon the truths of natural science. They can convince each other by means of science. Science is a unifying truth amid the relativities of perspective. Our common ground is set by nature's reality principle as well, not by human wish. We value and fight over different things, but death is death for us all and something that we seek to avoid. We worship differently, but for the deistic Voltaire and the deistic Montesquieu, though we worship differently in different creeds and churches, we all worship the same author of nature. For both Montesquieu and Voltaire, there is a deep sense that an awareness of relativism should lessen national and religious pride. Europeans discover there are better governed lands, more peaceful religions than their own, more ancient civilizations than their own, more generous human beings than those found in Europe.
For both, that awareness should promote tolerance and move us toward the search for what we have in common as human beings. Empirical science over wish, the recognition of natural needs and consequences, and for both deists, the worship of the author of nature. The heart of the Persian letters lies in two of its most striking tales that Montesquieu himself underlines. The parable of the troglodytes, a wild tribe dating back to prehistoric times, and the human reality of the harem in Persia. Montesquieu in both of these tales simultaneously explores the malleability and relativity of human life and value on the one hand and the universals of nature on the other. These two tales lead to and dramatically illustrate the conclusion that forms of government and the most basic forms of human association arise in response to specific circumstances and that makes them relative, but they have real consequences and those consequences are universal. In the parable of the troglodytes, Montesquieu teaches that survival and death are no relative construct of the human mind. They are realities that set natural limits to human variations. The original troglodytes are wild and vicious, and they need a tyrant to survive, to live. But tyrannized, the troglodytes hate that tyranny over their freedom to do what they please and they rebel anarchically and selfishly. And they find themselves in vicious anarchy. No one will honor a contract. I've gotten what I want. Why should I give back what someone else wants? A foreign doctor comes to cure them of a disease. After they're cured, they refuse to pay him. The next time the disease occurs, the doctor will not come back. They are incapable of voluntary, mutually beneficial transactions. In periods of drought, the highlands and the troglodyte lands are barren, and only the coast is productive. But no one on the coast will share with anyone in the highlands. But in periods of flood, there is nothing to be had on the coast, but now the highlands will not share with the coastal inhabitants. All of those ways of being human for the troglodytes are in some sense natural. Are we naturally vicious, selfish, virtuous, capable of following enlightened self-interest? Yes, we are all of those things at the same time, but these have natural consequences. And in vicious anarchy, the troglodytes virtually perish. And by a kind of natural selection, only a handful of virtuous troglodytes, cooperative, kind, capable of keeping their words, survive. And they succeed. They flourish. They prosper. But in their virtue, they create a luxury that undermines the practice of virtue. Having through their virtue created the means of voluntary exchange and great wealth, they now wish to be governed so that they might attend only to wealth. 
and they revert to the rule of a king who says to them, you will end again under despotism. Thus, despite this extraordinary malleability of the human condition, there is an independent natural reality in which behaviors have real consequences and which point to universal values despite relativism, that human societies can achieve any number of forms, but they cannot survive unless they solve the problem of linking the individual to the broader society and the problem of security, of equity, and of justice. Such success, however, given human nature, will not be permanent. The harem, which is a narrative running throughout the Persian letters, shows both the extraordinary variation in what people take to be wholly given by nature, the form of association between men and women, and the enduring problem of despotism in human life. Montesquieu, who so admires so much about his Persians and permits them to criticize so much about French life, shows as well the contrast of the freedom of French women and the enslavement of women to a master's despotic will in the Persian harem. All cultures in general and power in particular for Montesquieu, assume that their particular forms of association are somehow natural. And everywhere in the world one sees despotism. Despotism is the subjection of one person's life to the whim and caprice of another person's will. But what happens in the story of the harem when Uzbek, a traveling Persian, leaves his harem to go in France is that once the despot is unable on the scene to exercise terror, once the despot is unable to exercise terror, a warning perhaps, of our parlementaire Montesquieu to the monarchy of France. The harem naturally revolts. Yes, despotism can sustain itself as a form of human association, but only as long as people are terrorized into obedience. And once the despot is gone or loosens his grip, the harem revolts. And as one of Uzbek's wives puts it in the concluding letter of the Persian letters, the laws of nature reassert themselves against the arbitrary will of an individual man. Only terror makes despotism seem stable and permanent. There is a human nature that always will strive to be free and to assert its freedom and choices when it can. The final relativism of the drama of the harem is Montesquieu's sad and ironic commentary upon human nature itself, upon the irony of despotism and our relativism themselves. The Persian Uzbek is a master analyst of despotism in France. He sees it in religion, he sees it in society, he sees it in politics. Uzbek sees all despotism around him except his own. And that is one of Montesquieu's deepest warnings about 
our knowledge and our use of it. Thank you very much.